Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Abby James. Abby is a long-time friend and former colleague of mine. So we worked together for the best part of <coughs> two decades. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, giving away our age there. Um, yes, we started at primary school. So, um, <laughs> Abby, um, great to have you with us. You're now working for AbilityNet, which is one of the UK's pan-disability charities. And the topic today is really we're focusing around the, the, the recent changes in legislation uh, for web accessibility, because um, in the last couple of months, the public sector web accessibility regulations have come into force, and, and this is a big change. So welcome back. Thank you, Neil. Great to see Access Chat um, has grown so much in the few years since I was last on. Um, I'm yes. really pleased to contribute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we're five years, by the way. <gasps> Amazingly. Five wow. years of doing this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone said I like the sound of my own voice. They won't lie. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, 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 um, let, let's stop me talking and, and let's let's talk about the the Web Accessibility Directive. Yes. So, so uh, the EU word, which is a difficult word to talk about in our UK context, but uh, essentially, you know, a few years ago, well, three years ago, come next month, uh, EU released uh, the Web Accessibility Directive, which was requiring all member states to make their public sector bodies um, meet accessibility requirements. Um, and also critically publish accessibility statements on their websites and mobile applications. And that is now rolling out across the EU, including the UK, because it went into our law last year. So uh, there's also UK law and will remain UK law wherever we are. Um, and also now the EU states like Norway are also looking at uh, moving into their regulation. So it's for, for um, Europe, it's quite a big change. For many countries, it's the first time we've got specific accessibility regulations, although we've already had quite a lot of disability and equality legislation. Um, this is actual technical standards. So it's interesting to see it roll out. Um, there seems to be lots of countries and organisations grappling with the actual mechanisms of implementing it, both on the practical side, the public sector side, but also the governmental side, because there's a huge requirement on them to monitor it um, as well. Yeah, and, I, and I think that this is something that that, that will take a while to, to, to bed in. Norway have a bit of a head start because they've been monitoring stuff through UDIFI for, uh, UFIDI, sorry, for a while. Um, but yeah, and the different methodologies are, uh, uh, between the different European member states are mm. somewhat marked. Yeah, so essentially, um, and Norway's sort of grappling with the changes because mm -hmm. they are different. Um, all websites produced by public sector bodies um, will have to meet uh, the equivalent of WCAG 2.1 level AA. It's actually the European standard, um, EN301549. But that also includes documents that are on their website. So anything that's downloadable and any systems that's run through a browser, including intranets. So you're talking HR systems, finance systems, software as a service throughout councils, all in the UK health systems, which is all considered public sector, and many parts of our education system, um, including most universities, further education, so post-16, and some aspects of schools as well. That is a really high bar to meet. Um, it's really good to see expectations being raised, but um, yeah, we're a bit behind the curve on actually people understanding what's expected. But I think um, what, what's really also interesting is um, just getting people to understand that accessibility isn't just necessarily a public website. It is all aspects of dig digital communication that they're going to be sending. So particularly uh, where I work in the university sector, because I still work with the University of Southampton and Manchester on some research, um, things like prospectuses, um, accommodation booking systems, library systems, all of that, they're suddenly having to realise, oh, these should have been accessible already. Um, and a critical thing as well for the private sector is third party content, that software and tools that have been bought in by these public sector also have to be accessible as well. So although this doesn't cover 
the private sector, we see this as going to trickle down into the into those private organisations, either building bespoke or people buying in software systems as well. Uh, and I, I think that uh, this came as a bit of a surprise to some people, I think, <laughs> yes. it's fair to say, particularly the sort of extension into the, the education sector and the requirements around documents. It's stuff that we've been saying for a long time. So it's, it's good to see that the awareness is finally um, hitting home, but uh, am I am I right in thinking that there's still quite a bit of resistance, and that uh, that some some people think that it doesn't apply to them? Yeah. So so unfortunately, oh well. I mean, the UK is a, a case where we have taken exactly what was written in in the EU directive and put it into our law. They have the option to extend it to other parts of you know, public organisation. They've taken the exact definition, and um, which is a definition for procurement purposes so there's no clear line of what is public sector it literally comes down to who funds it who's on the governance board and all things such as that and that means that um we've got some organizations who are pushing back and saying well this doesn't apply to us we are not public sector you know we're not a central government we're not local government but we are a public service essentially <sighs> The actual fact is, under most European law, and the UK at least, they should have been doing it anyway. It's going to be for part of our Equality Act is to make sure you make reasonable adjustments. So all these organisations that are saying the regulations don't apply, actually, they should have been doing it anyway. And it's only the additional requirements of providing accessibility statements so that the government can monitor whether they are complying with it is actually part of this this new regulations as such but what we want to do particularly in the community supporting disabled people is demonstrate the potential benefits of talking about accessibility as part of these regulations as well it's really great for me as an assistive technology user that i could now go to my local government or my library site and look at whether it is going to be accessible for me and I can use it. And if I have a problem, I should be able to go and ask for help and know who to complain to if they don't resolve the issue. Um, so I know Deborah's got a question and I'm going <laughs> to hand over in a second, but I think you mentioned something that's really important. Um, yes, this stuff was um, supposed to be being done already. And yes, it was covered under the Equality Act, but the Equality Act was, as you quite rightly said, quite woolly on definition. So what you've now got are two pieces of legislation that are complementary. So you've got some clarity about what the standards are and, and the technicalities in, in the new uh, public sector web regulation. And it says that a failure to do that is a breach of the Equality Act. So now you've also got the strength of the Equality Act, which is the um, the uncapped penalties, as the you know the the incentive for organisations to actually go and do something. So and and that's a big step change because essentially in the UK no one knew how you could apply yeah. the Equality Act because yeah. it was always subjective. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, it was really clear if you couldn't, you know, if somebody was in a wheelchair and came up to a door that they physically couldn't open the door and the door had to be wide enough for them to get through, that was a clear, reasonable adjustment. But what we had in terms of websites is the website was there, but you couldn't actually tell if somebody could get through or not on what was reasonable and what was that expectation. So we now have the setting out, although in a public sector content, but we do have statute that says that meeting web accessibility requirements is a reasonable adjustment. And we know that in the wider European context with the European Accessibility Act, the same principles will be being applied to many parts of the private sector. E-commerce, e-banking, e-books are all covered by that legislation that will be coming down into member states so it's really good but i think what's also important to point out from the point of view um for many of the european company governments and um from the point of view of the accessibility statement is there's a recognition that not everybody will be perfect obviously as an accessibility consultant i can find a problem you know you can always find one little label that's wrong or alt text 
getting that 100% compliance is a really high bar. But within this directive and all the legislation that's coming out of it is the recognition that um, you're working towards fully compliant and you're open about what you can achieve from accessibility and you can start that conversation. And the approach that's been taken, uh, is going to be taken at least by the UK government is to support and help people improve. And we've seen that also with the Norwegian approach where they've only gone to that real compliance and fines when somebody has been told what to do, how to fix it over a long period of time and still not done it. Um, so we have the potential to really help organisations and IT professionals understand accessibility and move them along the journey to improving it. Which I think is a really good point because, <clears throat> you know, we've seen, we've done it in the U.S. and once again, I, I, I'm, it's, we, we've done it the difficult way in the U.S. We talked about this before we got on air, but, um, but at the same time, if we hadn't taken our litigious approach, I don't think we would be as far along as we are because we forced our uh, corporations to pay attention to this. And yet, through forcing our corporations to do this, we've actually created a whole bunch of other problems, um, including, you know, um, dominoes, you know, is, is a good example, you know, being confused, they actually worked on making their websites accessible, and they spent a lot of money making them accessible, and yet they were still sued. And the reality was still people that were blind could not decide which toppings that they wanted on their pizza like everybody else. So it, we accidentally caused a lot of confusion in the marketplace. I know that's a surprise. Um, but but also there are things that I know that the European laws in the UK and all different laws that have come, you know, because of the work that we've done in the US. So I'm proud of the work that we've done in the US. Uh, I know that um, our states have gotten involved in the US with legislation. And you mentioned that, and this is such, to me, such a dub point, but if there is a problem, if I'm a person with a disability and I'm using your website and I have a problem, where do I go? Do I go in the U.S. right to my lawyer or do you tell me who to go to so I can tell you I have a problem and we try to fix it together, which of course I think is a better practice. But um, Oklahoma uh, years ago created um, a law that was a little bit stricter than our federal law. Uh, Section 508, part of a Rehabilitation Act 19, of 1973, and they said that every single website in, and once again, we were looking at it from a public as opposed to private, but every website had to tell you where to go if you had an accessibility problem, which I thought was just so smart because please don't just call your lawyer, um, please call us and hopefully we're not going to ignore you and blah, blah, blah. But it, there's there's got to be some real common sense when it comes to accessibility and, um, it, and there hasn't always been in these conversations. And unfortunately, all this litigation and stuff in the U.S. has really created an us and them, um, which has become pretty significant in the United States. And um, a lot of our corporations, they don't, e they don't really understand how to really truly become accessible. So I liked the comment you made, Abby, about being perfect, because I've been in the accessibility field for many, many years, and I would not dare to say that anybody was perfect, including me, because we don't even know what that means. Technology is just changing too quickly. And so I really applaud, you know, what the EU is doing, and I'm so glad the UK is still part of it. And um, because I think we can continue to learn from each other, which I think is very important. And I think it's great. I mean, I think one of the things we have now to reflect on I mean, the U.S. has definitely led the, led the way in sort of you know, both the opportunity to, to take, take the litigious route, which we haven't necessarily had, even though people may have wanted to. It's just not been there for us. Um, but also to show it is possible. So when talking again about the university sector, I have you know, university going, how are we meant to do this? Even you know, this morning on Twitter, academics going, we can never make our PowerPoints accessible, you know, et cetera. Well, the US universities and colleges have been doing this for decades. And yes, they do get pulled up by the Justice Department. But actually, normally the professionals in those in those universities and colleges are welcoming that input from external resources. Again, we are trying to do the best we can. You know, please come and help us. So we've been demonstrated by, by the US and some other countries that this is possible. You you can set these benchmarks and work towards them. Um, but I think you know one thing also from the point of view outside the public sector, 
Uh, we had a survey that was done in 2016 by the Clickaway Pound. I'm sure they probably discussed it. It's just been run again. 71% of disabled customers will just walk away from a website if they can't access it. If you had somewhere where you could just say, well, you know, these are the things that we know might be a problem, but these are the things you can work around. You know, yes, you can zoom to X percentage, but not beyond it. Then I know before I start where I can go to and what I can use and what I can't use. Uh, and that's that's empowering me as a consumer of public sector services as well as commercial services as well. I'm more likely to buy off somebody where I can make the font bigger so I can read it better than, as I always say, book a train ticket on the wrong date, which is my mom or booba. <laughs> No, I, I could say that academics are not particularly great at making PowerPoints anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an active one. <laughs> but uh, one of our uh, Twitter friends, Marsha Cole, she often says that if you have, when you are creating a product, if you need a webinar to explain it, you are doing it all wrong. So, and she's not, she's talking more about usability, about creating new products, but if you need to add that layer of information to instruct people how to use something, it basically you have failed. Okay, that's uh, one of the arguments that she you often uh, talks about. But I would like to talk to you about procurement professionals. What will be their role in this new uh, legislation? Well, it's really interesting on the procurement side because the standard from the European perspective was originally written as a procurement standard. Um, and, and there is lots of resources there for helping organisations to purchase accessibility, accessible IT in the widest context, desks as well as um, software and websites. And um, I think they're critical uh, and there is some work within the communities I'm working in um, uh, to, to work out what we should be getting procurement people to say and training them. How do we actually engage them? Uh, because we don't have a system like the US with VPATs and 508. We're not getting that. Um, you know, what you often see in procurement is, do you meet with CAG standards? Tick, yes. Well, what does that actually mean? And can you actually demonstrate that? So there is a sort of action, really activity with procurement people to give them some basic understanding of accessibility to say, well, actually, can I just do a quick check? Can I have a look? Can I get somebody who's disabled to come and look at this? You know, really great things we see of, you know, getting a few members of staff or students that can you just test this for me and see what you think and getting that realistic view um, and setting expectations. So procurement is going to be really critical. And that's where um, at the moment, you know, even central government is really struggling because they're going to their, their private suppliers and saying, well, we need this to be accessible. And they're just going, no, can't do it. Oh, it's in the roadmap for years ahead. And that's where we really can learn from the US and try and, and learn their approach to making sure that we're only buying in accessible at source. You know, born digital, born accessible. Um, 508s don't really work, VPATs don't really work that information. Um, and we need to find a way of making sure that in the European context, private companies can explain what accessibility they do support and what they <laughs> what they don't support. <laughs> um, Abby, Abby, you reminded me of it, it was the, I'm dating myself, but I've been in this field since 2001. And I remember when Europe was first deciding how they were going to do accessibility. And we in the United States, and it's a big collective we, the corporations in the United States were very concerned that Europe and then maybe, you know, UK at the, you know, well, UK was part of it, obviously, at the yeah. time and still is. Okay, sorry. We're part and, of the continent of Europe. Get into the, the Brexit <laughs> thing. Uh, but um, we were, con the, the corporations were concerned that you were going to enact things um, that they weren't going to be, that they wanted to control it a little bit better. Let's just be blunt. That's what it was. And so I remember coming over, I was brought over by a very large corporation in the United States. It was one of my clients. And we were in the talks, those first talks where y'all were, the, the, the EU was trying to decide what to do with this. And 
um, we were trying, the U.S., were trying to convince the EU that, um, no, no, just let the corporations handle this. We got it. We got it. We Y'all don't need to worry about it. We got this. Just because that's the way we were doing things in the U.S. And for some reason, y'all wouldn't buy it. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> you did not buy it. But it was, it's just funny thinking about how it has unfolded. And once again, in the US, there was so much confusion with corporations when it comes, and, and I just say corporations because there is confusion in all aspects of, you know, the, the community. The, you know, there's a lot, still a lot of confusion in the academia, the, even the governments are still struggling to truly be accessible. There is definitely, definitely been progress, but I often hear from the corporations that the accessibility consultants in the United States don't really understand the complexity of their lives and what they have to deal with and everything they're, all the, you know, the objects and just the sheer volume of what they're having to deal with. And then, of course, you then put on mergers and activities into it and they're acquiring stuff. And uh, I just often hear in the United States, and maybe because we're so litigious, that um, the the vendors don't really understand what they have to do to truly be uh, accessible. So how are they supposed to understand? And I was just curious how what you're doing might help reduce some of the confusion, hopefully all over the world. And I know that's a hard question, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, it's, you know, I'm involved with WCAG and W3C stand, and the standards are so complex to understand and meet. And, you know, I'm also an accessibility consultant. I go into organizations and, and do that testing. The corporations, organizations developing digital content systems, etc., are so complex. And accessibility is always thrown in at the end with these standards to test against. Actually, you need to be thinking about it right at the beginning. Talk about this design for all, inclusive design. In those requirements, it should be there. Um, and if that is not there from the beginning, it is so difficult to stop the roller coaster of digital development um, to, to, to make sure that these issues don't arise. And as these standards you know, are moving, particularly to the less Yes, no pass fail areas. Um, Neil and I work on the COGA group on WCAG, it, trying to help people with a range of cognitive disabilities. We really need to be getting organisations to be thinking at those first principles of how they support accessibility. And there may be situations where they go, you know what, you know, we can do 90% of this or 70% of this, but it's about that open and understanding um, rather than just wanting a certificate at the end of it to go, yeah, we pass. And the European system allows for that. Um, you know, within the regulations, we've got partial compliance and we have disproportionate burden. We have opt outs. You know, there's 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 reason. It's reasonable. It's what can you do? But you've got to communicate that and explain it and explain how you're going to improve that. So, for example, we were talking to a government advisor trying to unpack this in terms of the procurement situation, uh, and he was saying, well, you know, if you've only got one system that you can buy. And it's not accessible. OK, but you've got to make sure that next time you come around, accessibility is a priority or you've got to provide an alternative. If you're making decisions, you've got to make sure that accessibility is on there. And I think what's quite interesting with this process we're now going to be going through is people are going to be starting to evaluate the cost of implementing accessibility and um, remediating it or even alternative. Um, access, whereas before that was like, oh, let's push it over to, you know, the complaints department or, you know, disability support or, you know, social workers or whoever or uh, occupational therapists. Now it's going to be on the procurement people to actually say, well, actually, if I buy that inaccessible version, it's going to cost us X thousands of pounds more and potentially put us at risk of complaints and compliance of non-conformance versus this one over here that's slightly more expensive but has this already built in as well yeah uh, and i think that we on internal projects and and some of our customer projects have known about this for for a long time the the cost depending on the technologies is is between three and five percent of the total cost of a project you know spitball here uh, but but this is this is you know it does it does vary if you do it from the very beginning 
we know that there have been projects where we have spent more than 100% of the original project budget where we haven't factored in accessibility and had to do rework. Rework is really, really painful. It's really expensive. And in long-term projects where you're going to own them for a very long time, that cost mounts up over years. So, so, so that's why the investment up front is, is actually money well yeah. spent. And then, Antonio, I know you've got a question, so I'll hand over to you. No, it's a, a, not in the same uh, topic, but uh, I'm particularly interested in knowing that uh, there's a lot of investment from the EU to support startups and new business. And I'm just, I was very interested to see how companies and new business who really want to apply for those funds need to start considering accessibility by default when they are proposing a new app or when they are pitching uh, at the EU in the different apps and incubators that they have ar around Europe. I think it will be, I'm very, very interested on, on, on this topic because we often see uh, startups or ignoring uh, the topic of accessibility, even or, or or sometimes something that they don't even know anything about. So I'm very interested to see how this will impact the development of new business, especially uh, within the startup community in Europe. Yeah, and we've seen in in the EU, obviously, yeah, a lot of the regulations. This is down to implementing the UN. Um, CRPD, so that you know rights for the people, persons with disability, um, and making sure it's in everybody's laws. But it's also within a, a lot of their um, key areas about social empowerment and elderly support. And um, it was really interesting with the new commission coming in. So you know these are the new top guys coming in. That that one of them you know has started to talk about accessibility and inclusion already as a key area, but. What happens is those, there's so many of those projects in the EU that you've got to have somebody who knows about accessibility in that whole monitoring and, and reviewing process and setting the parameters to make sure it is included. Because so many times, um, particularly when we've been talking about teaching accessibility or improving knowledge or making sure it's embedded in all these projects, people go, Oh no, that's not a problem. Or oh no, we're doing that anyway. And you're like, hang on, no, you're not. So that there's that there's that knowledge and awareness of accessibility. And to be honest, you know, the word accessibility in itself is a barrier. People have so many different interpretations of it as well. So it might be that if we start to say, see people, well, you've got to put an accessibility statement on this. And you know, are, are you taught a, a useful way of communicating accessibility through? what is essentially public sector legislation actually starting to set um, expectations for everybody it's, it, it feels like such a good opportunity at the moment to, to move it forward yeah I, I think there's also an opportunity there's a an a commissioner designate uh that that we we know um <laughs> <laughs> he's just stepped down as our our, our CEO and chairman, um, huh? so he's been nominated as the uh, commissioner designate for technology. So I'm Yay. hopeful that uh, <laughs> that that uh, our former boss Thierry Breton will be a champion for accessibility. If not, I'll be uh, sending the <laughs> in the background. Um, I know. I think it's important. He's and, and I think he's also. Uh, it, it'll be interesting because he drove. Uh, our efforts around sustainability as an organization it's something people don't know about atos is how um sustainable the organization is it's the number one um it provider of, for sustainability on all of the indices we've got our own wind farms and we're doing all kinds of stuff so um when wow. when when he puts his mind to this kind of stuff it happens so i'm i'm kind of hopeful in in, in that respect um I do think you're right. This kind of overarching market change is, is is massive, and it will have an impact. But it's also going to take time. It's all going to, it's going to take massive change uh, in terms of education, and that's something that I'm passionate about as well because I think that um, you know, we need to educate the procurement people. They need to understand what it is. Uh, you mentioned that we don't necessarily have VPATs, but the VPATs now f also have 
sections for EN301549 and, and WCAG 2.1. And so I'm teaching our procurement people how to critically read a VPAT. You know, the, the basics, how to cynically read it yeah. and understand that meets with exceptions means hotline to the accessibility <laughs> team. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so, so those kind of things are happening. They need to happen more. Um, the, um, and we need to be teaching the people that are creating the technologies. The other thing that I think okay. is absolutely crucial that we get a grip on um, and we've, we've covered before a bit on Access Chat is is the other um, W3 standard, which is the authoring tools standard, so ATAG, because when you're making content, it's got to be accessible. So, and, and there are lots and lots of tools at the moment that are coming out that don't require people, and it's a code. You've got low code, you've got no code. So, so essentially, what people are doing is building with stuff, and they're not they're not now these you know technology wizards. They're they're the us and me's. It's it's becoming a bit like the desktop environment where suddenly you know having your own desktop publishing tools enabled you to do something that before you would go to a shop for or you go to a professional for. Now you know you make your own powerpoints, you make your own publications. That's happening with apps too. Yeah. Uh, it's happening with websites. We've been doing it for a long time, but but it's it's coming. It's everywhere, and therefore they're going to play a really important role in how accessible you know our environment is. So what what's quite interesting is a lot of people will think with these regulations, oh, it's just WCAG. It's WCAG 2.1 level A8. Yeah, it's not. It's EN301549. That includes authoring tools. So actually, when you drill down into that standard, it does include exactly what a software should do, including authoring tools. So it does have a requirement saying if you're making content, it needs to be accessible. And, you know, unfortunately, at the moment, the UK government is WCAG 2.1. But I'm not sure that's correct. Um, and it will be interesting to see how it evolves and how other countries take it on. Um, I know that there's another sort of draft around of that standard, which has a bit more information about how to implement it. But actually, we should be taking from that standard the functional statements of just literally, does it work for somebody with X usage? Does it work with somebody with limited vision, limited hearing, limited mobility, and so on? And that should be the fundamental statement. And even if it doesn't you know, pass or fail a particular standard, if we can prove that, that should be enough to have the problem. Because technology is always evolving. And, and accessibility, by its nature, is always a few years behind because we're always trying to catch up with new techniques and new, new coding and you know, new ways of doing things. And we should just be saying, fundamentally, you need to prove that it works. Um, because otherwise, in the standards culture, we, you know, we sit there and fight over one word meaning five different things <laughs> um, and, and embedding that culture. Um, and, and I think that will be interesting to see both with how standards develop, because they are trying to get more user testing into, into how you evaluate it, but also how um, these regulations actually sit. If somebody does go, well, it doesn't matter, I still can't use it, even you're saying it's complying, what is going to happen? Um, and actually, you know, authoring content is a really critical one. Social media content, you know, um, we're all going on at the moment about captions on videos on social media. We really need to be raising the bar and making sure that people understand the fundamental basics of, of making any content um, usable for anyone, anywhere. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's not going to happen overnight either. But but it's got a, you know, it, it's a start, and and the pragmatism is important because because I think that that pragmatism is what's going to bring people along. Um, because I think Deborah, I don't know whether she, you said it or you put it in the chat window. You were talking about undue burden before, when mm -hmm. we when we basically are so focused on the you know the letter of the law rather than pragmatism people can object and, and and so we we need that that kind of flexibility in those frameworks to to to, to move us from where we are now to where we'd like to be and yes, and I think, i've seen those emails i think pragmatism the, the needs semantic. to be on both, yes. both, both oh, yeah. sides um and if we're communicating that clearly to people using digital platforms you know i'm being pragmatic this is what i think i've done this is where we are at and this is what we hope to do then you get it back as well. You're not like, well, I just can't use your site. It is like, well, I can do this bit, and this bit's quite good. And the other thing is about 
um, from the disabled community, from the AT community, how do we communicate to developers about accessibility issues? Um, you know, again, the role we often play as accessibility experts is interpreting this accessibility stuff into technical stuff and back again um, to designers or watch like is that communication issue and actually um, setting expectations is great not setting them too high but also expectations backwards well if you do find a problem engage with the organization and try to get them to improve because often they don't understand the problems they've built into their systems you, you get the biggest problem we have on accessibility is color contrast and that's because so many people choose their color scheme based on their logos <laughs> and use orange and things like that if people just understood look this is just a really big problem for me um and this is why and were communicated clearly that would really help yeah no i 100 percent agree i think we're pretty much at the end of our half hour <laughs> it's been um it's been fun it's uh, been informative. I think we're going to have a, a lively chat on Twitter uh, on Tuesday. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you back. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, and, 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 we, course, and always yes. special, special thanks to our sponsors and our supporters. We love them so much. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much to Barclays Access, Microlink, and MyClearText for keeping the lights on, keeping us captioned, keeping us accessible. You guys rock. We love you guys. <laughs>